Hi everyone, my name's Declan McGlynn. Welcome to Friday Forum Live, Point Blank's weekly broadcast bringing you exclusive tutorials, artist interviews and industry insight every Friday live from East London. Today we're joined by Point Blank instructor Anthony Chapman to look at how to beef up your bass guitar recordings and samples. So today is all about bass, but of course we are barely scratching the surface. So if you want to dive deeper into music production and sound engineering, make sure you check out our courses at pointblanklondon.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any more tutorials and get your, make sure you get your questions for Anthony in the chat and we'll get to them throughout the broadcast. Anthony, welcome back. W How are you doing? Lovely to be here. Yeah, it's my first uh, in the new studio. Yeah, it's not bad, yeah, is it? First time, it's good. Yeah, very nice, very nice. <laughs> cool. So. Bass, obviously there's loads of bass synth, especially in electronic music. There's lots of different types of bass, not just bass frequencies, blah, blah, blah. Today is more about recorded bass and bass yeah. samples, like electric guitar bass, right? Absolutely. Okay, so yeah, cool. so what we're looking at today is electric bass. Um, so this is very much focused on, the first part of what I'm going to show you is focused on actual bass guitar uh, mm -hmm. performances recorded. Uh, this is, so I actually I'm a bass player originally. That was my uh, that was my first instrument. Um, so I enjoyed getting a bass out and recording yeah, yeah. a little bit for this today. It was quite fun. Um, and really, if you're possibly, I think a lot of people may not be totally sure about the sound of a bass guitar. Like they may be familiar with making electronic music and certain kinds of tracks and certain kind of sounds, but they're not totally from. You know, they might not be able to say, "Oh, that's definitely a bass guitar I'm hearing in that track." Um, what we're really talking about is some great examples of, of artists who feature a lot of either bass guitar or samples of bass guitar would be people like Daft Punk, um, Justice. There's lots of people on that kind of slightly more, uh, I always think of them as the more album oriented sort of electronic artists yeah. rather than the straight up, you know, singles on Beatport and stuff like that. Um, obviously a lot of hip hop. Traditionally, we'll have samples that will contain a lot of bass guitar. Um, and then obviously in the news lately is uh, Noel Rogers and Chic. And so obviously a lot of people have been going back and checking that stuff and the mm. bass, uh, Bernard Edwards, who played bass on that, yeah, it was legend. a total legend. And you know, that's like probably the most important element, I think, of, of those tracks. Because yeah. most of those famous singles, we think of the bass line. That's what we think of first. So, um, so it's really important, but what I want to sh show everybody, hopefully, is that just because it's a bass guitar, as you mentioned before, the bass frequencies are not the be-all and end-all right. of it. Um, it's, the, it's the same as lots of other things in dance music. I think um, one of the things I always pick up on with students a lot of the time early on and have to work with is things like kick drums, like bass drums. And I'll see assignments that they submit and they have all the high frequencies rolled off. And I'm like, we need the high frequencies as well. We need, you know, it's the bass drum and the bass is a really important element of it, but the high frequencies are really important in terms of tone, but also in placing it in, in the, the beat. You know, it tells us where it is, because bass frequencies don't have particularly sort of pronounced transients. They don't snap, they don't, yeah. they, you know, and also often they're a bit late because they take longer to get to you. So, um, so it, hopefully with this, I'm gonna show you a similar thing that with bass guitar on bass guitar style sounds, not only part of it is to do with the playing, either of a guitar or the keyboard, it's also to do with, to do with the sound. Yeah. Now, one thing I want to say is, um, if you're wanting to experiment a little bit recording bass guitar, um, don't think that you need an expensive guitar, don't, certainly don't think that you need an amp. I never use a bass amp uh, anymore. I only ever use a bass amp on stage. I don't really play bass for anyone at the moment, but if I was going to use one, I would only use it on stage. I mm. never use it in the studio. Um, Anyone who's got even, like we have in the college year, those little Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 interfaces, that's got an instrument input, you switch to it. Any electric guitar, any instrument with a pickup, you can just plug into that. And if you're using Logic or Ableton Live or any other software, pretty much everything's got kind of amp simulations that are, sound really good. That's all you need, that's all you need. So if it's something you're really interested in, I would say, you know, borrow a bass guitar of somebody, if you want to buy one, go to like a second hand shop, just buy something that looks half decent, but it's cheap, and then experiment. And, and I think you'll find you'll bring some really unique sounds to what you're doing. Yeah. So look, I've got, um, I've got a little kind of 
uh, what is this? Is it like a 16 bar loop or something like that? Um, which I've just put together to sort of showcase some, some bass guitar, okay? So I played this, so uh, be nice. But, um, uh, it's very simple, you know, it's, not, it's nothing too spectacular. I did really enjoy playing it. But just to give you an idea, this is the beat without the bass. So I've put a few elements in, a few other elements there, just drop some loops in, because I just want it to showcase the bass in context. And then I'll turn the bass on. You can hear it's totally like that Daft Punk, just as kind of, yeah. yeah pretty, oh, you, oh, you see, I should have known you. <laughs> I'm sure I've talked about that track on FFL before. There's a track in, in uh, intro, by yeah, Alan Braggs and Fred Felt, which, it, it, yeah, yeah, it's that kind of do, those three yeah. notes at the start, but that is an amazing track. It's really, that still sounds amazing, that track, I think. So let's just have a listen to the bass on its own. So it's more distorted in solo than you would expect. Exactly, and this is something that's really important. So when you hear it in the track, what you might find is that all you're really picking up on is the low frequencies. But to get it to sit in the track properly, a lot of the time you're going to need a little bit of bite, some transients in it. Yeah. Now I played this with a, a pick, a plectrum, um, and if you listen, especially on those little sixteenths there, you can really hear the pick. Um, I, I tried it with my fingers, and I could play it with my fingers, but the problem was the beats are fairly heavy. And when I was playing it with my fingers, it just didn't feel precise enough. Because yeah. if you think about the way the finger strikes the string, you know, it's kind of curved and smooth. So rather than getting that ding, you get that vroom, that kind of thing. So I thought, I want to try it with a pick, see if I can get it really precise. So I did it that way. I warped it a little bit just to really nail it. If I was doing this with a band, I probably wouldn't warp it routinely. It's just because I was doing this with beats that were totally, you know, on the on the money. Um, so this is the this is pretty much the straight sound. If I, well, actually, I'll tell you what. I'll turn off all of the processing. That is the raw DI sound. So it's quite middly. Yeah. So remember, there's no amplifier involved in this. This is literally just the bass guitar plugged into a DI, a direct injection box. Well, in this instance, it's a, it's a preamp that I use for all my, my teaching and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's for, mainly for mics, but it's got an input for an instrument. Um, and there's a little bit of compression on it from the preamp. The preamp's valve as well, so it's, you know, it's gonna warm it up a little bit, but still, I know that I'm gonna to need to do something with that. So that's, to me, listen to that, that's a really good raw sound, but I know I'm gonna to have to work on it a bit more. So let me show you uh, in this rack here what I've been doing. Oops. So if we look at the devices inside here, and this rack, by the way, is going to be available to download, I, yeah, I understand. Yeah, it's available to download, it's, I think, right now. Right, it's very simple, it's just factory devices. There may be something in there that requires sweet, I can't say offhand, but you should be able to get something out of it, even if you're just using live. I'm just going to turn the rack on, and I'm going to sort of turn the devices off within it. And we can just sort of take a look at them one by one. So, this is the Ableton Amp device, okay? And this is made by Softube, who are renowned for their uh, modeling of hardware, fantastic. And um, this is their bass amp model. So basically they've just, they've analyzed what a, a bass amplifier, I'm not sure what amp it is specifically that they've done for this, but they've just analyzed how that changes the signal of a bass guitar through it. So just by using that straight away, if you listen, Great. Yeah. It's just it just makes it so much warmer. It's there's a bit of an EQ curve on it. Now what you'll see is I've mapped some macros to this. So I've mapped the bass and the treble controls here. Okay, so we've got some control there, and that's really really handy. And then also the presence, and the presence is a thing you get on guitar amps, and it's usually like a, a kind of a high mid bump. And basically, if you just want something to have more presence, for it to be more present, more forward, you just crank that up a bit. I've left the middle out. Um, you can always, you know, alter that yourself. Now, the next thing is the cabinet. Now, most of the time, if you're using the amp plug-in, you're really going to want to use cabinet after it. The cab cabinet is the speaker simulator. So if I turn this on... So this is simulating it going through a 4x10 bass speaker 
and then with a, a, a mic up close, it's a condenser mic, it's coming out in mono. Okay. So you can just hear the difference there. It loses a lot of that brightness, but it's very warm and it just kind of starts to sound like it's happening in a room. Got my EQ here. Now there's a slightly weird scoop in this EQ, and this is because I just played around with this a bit. And I just found that these kind of couple of bumps here, these notches out, worked really well. It's very, very woolly down there. Yeah, that second and third harmonic. Uh, exactly. Pretty so bright. you can see the harmonics here, you know, and this is very, very sort of big and woolly. So basically I just kind of did that, and then I've mapped my uh, macro here. I've got this thing scoop. So that's without it. Okay, and that is going to help it to fit in with everything else in the mix. Yeah. Now, if we carry on, we've got uh, our compressor here, and that obviously is just going to do some compression. Compression and bass guitar is, I think, really a lot of the time it is made for compression. It's one of the things I find you can happily do a lot of compression and it will sound great. It can really, really cope with it well, yeah. okay? Um, I mean, I always think of, you know, a lot of us nowadays, we're using um, emulations of the 1176. The 1176 is just like the, the, the godsend for bass. You know what I mean? It's just perfect. So many times in the studio, I've just had an 1176 and just push all of the ratio buttons in and just wind it on and it's, Go, the, the needle's going like that. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great. It can, it can handle it. Yeah. It can really handle it. So there, if I just turn that up, get more and more compression. Now, this point is where things get, things get a little bit more interesting and a bit more creative. So I've put a rack within a rack, okay? Um, this is one of the things I love about Live. And also, we were talking about this before, with the new update of Live 9.2, yeah. this has become even more uh, effective. One of the changes they made in 9.2 is that the delay compensation for processing is much more effective. And so we can do this kind of splitting uh, without getting phase problems. So if I turn this rack on, and basically I've got three, so at this point I split the signal into three. I've got my clean channel there, I've got drive and chorus there. So if I go back to my macros here, I've got this thing that says dirt. If I turn this up. So you see, so now if we go back, if we take this out solo, See, when you listen to it on its own, the dirt seems a bit much. But all that kind of, yeah. all that stuff, it starts to cut through, you know? I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, I play in a really horrible rock band as well, and I love crazy distorted bass. But I've learned over the years that a bit of distortion can really be your friend in the mix. It doesn't need to present itself as like, oh, I'm a crazy distorted bass. It's just the distortion is just like poking out. It's really, really useful. So we've got that, and then I've also got chorus here. You might need to solo this as well, really, to hear it. That's in parallel. Yeah, so this is all in parallel. So all three of these, you know, basically the signal gets to this point in the rack and it's just split into three chains. Now, the really important thing with the chorus chain, the reason I've put that separately is that I'm killing the low frequencies before they get into the chorus. Because if you put the low frequencies into the chorus, it's going to cause huge problems. I mean, the thing about this sound is it w I wouldn't want it for this track, but there's some stuff you would do on. It's very 80s, yeah. you know, and That's some people that. might find much that big. a little bit, but very you know. Much big, kind it, of never it, mind. It, it, exactly, yeah. exactly. So it's a really useful thing to have. Then the last thing in my rack here is a limiter. So basically, I can just turn that up, and then that will just start to push it into the limiter there. I don't think we're actually limiting yet at that point. I think it's switched up. Oh, yes, so it is. So there we go. So it's quite a long way from the yeah. original sound, but let's hear it in the track, okay? Gonna pull that dirt back a little bit. Then the other thing is at the end of my chain here, and this goes the same for the bass guitar as it does for anything else, side chain off the kick drum. So basically I just want, because of this kind of bass line, it's gonna cross over with the bass drum lots of the time. And I just want, I just want, and we had a question about that, didn't we? We had a question. We did, we had Yuck, who was yuck. asking. <laughs> um, it's asking, I'm gonna scroll back up here. Uh, what's the best way, 
what's the best way to get, get the bass cut through the mix without making everything else sound muddy and yuck. And I think there's two things here. One is that side chain that I did there, because especially in, in dance music and electronic music, the kick drum really should have priority. You yeah. know, it really, really should. Um, so basically, it's, the way I always explain it to students is, just think of like a seesaw, and the bass is on one end of the seesaw, and the bass drum's on the other end. Only one side can be up. So, you know, every time the kick drum plays, boop, boop, the seesaw dips down like that. So um, that, that's, that's one. The other thing is um, that EQ, my scoop. That area there, it's just very muddy a lot of the time, especially when you start putting the bass through amps and stuff like that. Um, so that's, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a big one there for me. Also, make good use of the higher frequencies, like with that dirt, that dirt uh, macro there, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. One thing I, I wanted to show you as well, actually, was that I've also got, this is a nice little freebie plugin, is this uh, TSE, it's called the TSE BOD, um, TSE Bass Overdrive, okay? And basically, this is a model of a pedal called the Sansamp Bass Driver, uh, and this is free, and it doesn't sound exactly the same as the Sansamp, but it sounds really good, so. We just solo it and get an idea of what it's doing. So that's without it. And that's just on the default settings as well. The other thing is it's got a blend so you can kind of, you can parallel it if you want. So you could maybe drive it quite hard and then just blend a little bit of it in. Yeah. So it's really, really nice. Um, and well, you can't really go wrong for free, can you? No. So, <laughs> So I don't and, this, got... and this is this rack's going to be free as well. Isn't yes, it? absolutely. Yeah. So this this everything on the right here, uh, all of this in that little rack there. This is this will be available for a download for free. You yeah. know, like I said, it's not it's not you know I'm not it's not like oh I've got the secret source. It's just, it's all just using factory uh, devices. But hopefully it'll just make your life a little bit easier yeah. and also just give you something to play around with. You know, experiment a little bit. So. Yeah. And there's no reason at all why you would have to only use that on bass guitar. In fact, in a, exactly. in a second, I'll show you using it on some samples. Cool. So we dive into that. Then there's some questions coming in, but we'll get to them. Yeah, the cool. Again. Okay, no problem. So, so that's my amazing bass playing. <laughs> um, uh, like so that's yeah. So that's doing it with live bass. So what I did was I tried to recreate it with one of the Ableton library uh, instrument racks. Yeah, so if okay. you're not a bass player, if you don't, can't get hold of a bass, you can use your remote. Absolutely. Keyboard, yeah. One thing I would say as well is, um, one thing that can work quite well is just downloading bass loops and then just chopping it up and just experimenting. I mean, I've done that in the past. I've just played around bass, then just chopped it up and almost randomly just played around until I come, accidentally come up with a with a nice little thing. And not, rather than sampling individual notes, sample like little runs of two or three notes. Uh, and you can get really nice, uh, I mean again, kind of first Daft Punk album, I think of a lot of those bass lines as yeah. having that quality to it. Um, but you can also get pretty good uh, approximations of it using the, the, the instruments in Ableton. So this is just this, uh, this instrument rack preset called Electric Bass, okay? And what I've done is I've um, tried to mirror what I played in the bass line. Now obviously, if we listen to it in solo, and I turn off all the processing on it, because I've got my rack on this as well. So it's okay, it's a bit straight, it's a little bit, on it, without any processing it kind of sounds a little bit, uh, it's not super bassy, it's a very much the sound that they've sampled there, it's what I think of as like an active bass, it's kind of a powered, uh, yeah. Pick up bass. It's very sort of. Um, it's not really my kind of thing. I'm a, I'm a Fender jazz or precision guy. Very simple. Very utilitarian. Only four strings. I hasten to add. Never five strings. Uh, whenever I see people with five string basses, I just hold my head <laughs> in my hands. But that's just me. That, I'm I'm old, and that's just me. Um, but uh, yeah. But we can definitely do a job with this. You, you know. know. Cool. Now what I want to look at first is actually not to do with the sound of it, it's to do with the programming of it. Now this is one of the most crucial things if you're trying to make bass guitar style parts is what I would say is listen to, to bass lines like Chic is a brilliant example. Listen to those bass lines and maybe try and copy one of those with MIDI mm -hmm. and it will teach you a lot about the way bass players kind of instinctively 
set the length of the notes and stuff like that. It's so important. I think a lot of the time in electronic music, and I've, I've been there as well, we're used to dealing with bass that has a fixed envelope to it, especially if you think of like grime and, and, and you sort of, you know, kind of UK bass music, that kind of stuff. Very, I mean, I love music like that and I love bass lines that are like boom, 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 boom. You know, it's the same length every time, it's got the same envelope on it. I like that kind of rudeness of it and it's so like in your face. Yeah. But with a bass guitar, so much of the rhythmic element of it is to do with not just the notes you play, it's the length of the notes you play and then ghost notes and, and stopping. So a lot of the time a bass player, like that part that I played, you know, I'm kind of going do, 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 do. So that even there, do, do, do. Yeah. So there's all these little ghost notes. Now, it's difficult to do that when you're programming. You can do it. There are libraries out there. I know uh, some of the Native Instruments ones are very, very sophisticated. But even if you just set the notes, to be quite lyrical and quite, and really just think about it. So if you look at what I've done here. So you see here where it's got one really short note and then one longer note. So boom, boom. And then also the length of these here, I kind of agonized over that. I, could, I couldn't quite decide how long they should be. Should they be longer, should they be shorter, you know? I mean, I think the problem is that, you know, we're kind of used to electronic bass functioning a bit more. A bit more like that, yeah. you know? And for a bass guitar, it's just not going to work. Now, um, so that's the first thing I think you've got to think about. The other thing I would say is that um, in terms of the, the sound, um, just think about, with, well, with this instrument rack, you can choose the different articulations. So basically, at the moment, we're on the standard one. We can push it up a bit, and then we get, if we look at the bottom here, hang on, as I turn it up, We've got open, and then open with glide, then we've got palm. So that's like a muted one. Now if you're really clever, you can automate that to switch the chains. So you could go between muted parts, palmed parts, and open parts, yeah. which is great. Um, but I think one of the main things is, you see this has got 60% velocity sensitivity. On this instrument, it's not only changing the volume from the velocity, it's also got a bit of a filter on it. So if we look just quickly at the MIDI again, uh, if I open this up, you see I've done things like there. The first Look note's a lot quieter. And I've just tried to randomise everything a little bit so you're never getting the same velocity. Because obviously, if a human being is playing, well, pretty much any instrument, every time you make play a note, it's going to sound different. You know, especially something where the fingers are coming into contact with the strings or yeah. sticks are coming into contact with skins. It's always going to sound different every time. So, so what I've done is I've programmed that. I've kind of got it sounding okay in context of the track, but it did need a bit of work as well. And so I just brought out my rack again. So it, again, it just starts to sound more like uh, an actual bass, you know? Listening to it on its own, you know, we struggle a bit. And it responds quite differently to the dirt, to my, my bass. My bass yeah. is very bright, it had new strings on it as well. I even put new strings on, especially to do this. <laughs> it's but, yeah. but, um, but So it's gonna react differently. So let's hear it in the track. And in the track, I think it sounds perfect. It sounds totally convincing, you know? So for me, I mean, if, if I was kind of doing this track for real, I, I would be split over whether to use the live bass or whether to use the program yeah. one. You but know? you can always write. If you're on the road or whatever, or if you're not a bass player, you can always write in MIDI and then get a bass player yep, in. Or, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, give, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> I'll plug that. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, no, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit too rusty for any session work, I think, to be honest. But, you know, I think um, these kind of sounds, I think it's really... I, I always love a really good melding of electronic and organic sounds. If it's done well, it's so rich and so exciting. Um, and it's quite, it's quite in vogue at the moment. I think a lot of kind of more, you're, you're more slightly 
uh, art -y abstract, end of dance music. There's lots yeah. of samples coming in of bass and, and guitar and weird, just weird bits of live instrumentation. Not, not put out there as like, oh, look at me playing the guitar. Just like playing with the samples and really trying to bring a, a weird organic feel. Like not a, not, a, not, a, not a kind of snooty organic feel like, oh, this is so much better than everyone else. Like a, just a kind of strange. And it reminds me of sort of when, when hip hop was at its sort of peak of sampling. Uh, you know, when records were basically entirely made out of yeah. samples. It reminds me of that kind of feel of bringing those organic samples in. So. Yeah, exactly. Nice one. Cool. So we got some questions. Um, I'll try and get through them as quick as I can. Um, so Nicolas Grad Gradhall is asking, is the limiter in parallel to distortion and chorus? Uh, no, the limiter is um, right at the end of the rack. Hang on, let's go to the original one here. Uh, so if we take a look at the devices, so we get to this point after the EQ and the compressor, then I've got another rack which is going into three chains, and then after that rack I've got the limiter. So if you look here, this is this slight thing that it takes a little while to get used to on live, isn't it? You can see there's the end of my rack, right. and then I've got my limiter afterwards. So basically the signal comes down, splits into three chains, then that they get mixed together at the levels I've set, then it, they all come back together and go through the limiter in right. one. So yeah, so that is in series. Okay, cool. Um, Harishi Sagavakar is asking, is it a must to put the kick and bass in mono? Uh, it's a must to put the low frequencies in mono. That's, that's the key. Rather than saying the, the kick drum and the bass, like, as in the instruments, it's a must to put the low frequencies in mono. Um, I'm teaching mastering at the moment, right. um, and this is something that we look at a lot. To be honest, we looked at it a lot in mixing as well. Um, it's not so much about um, use, you know, putting the whole kick drum or the whole bass line in mono, but if you can get those low frequencies in mono. I mean, are you, you know, in Ableton Live, we're lucky. We can actually make a rack. I've, I'm sure I've been on here before where I've had my little MS uh, mixer rack where you can yeah. use that to kind of split the frequencies and uh, put all the low frequencies in mono. There's loads of tools for doing that. There's commercial pl things like um, BX Control mm -hmm. and um, Wave Center as well. That can enable you to push the, the, the low frequencies into mono. Uh, but yeah, so, so it's not kick drum and bass, bass line yeah. in mono, it's low frequencies right. in mono. Okay, so. yeah, that, I think that makes more sense. Um, Jared Credo is asking, if you record bass and it's a little off time, what tips would you need to warp it without it sounding artificial? I would say um, do what I did with this, which was to warp it totally manually. Um, I mean, well, obviously, if you've recorded like a 10 minute jazz odyssey on the bass, that's, <laughs> that's, gonna be, that's not gonna be super fun. But for me, I tried to just warp it automatically, and the problem with bass guitar is, as I was saying before, all those ghost notes, the Ableton warp engine doesn't really know what they are. Yeah. So I just went in and manually warped it. And then sometimes I don't warp bits of it. So if I've got very close together notes, doo -doo, those like little sixteenths, sometimes I'll just quantize it so it starts on the grid and then leave the second one and see what it sounds like. Um, but yeah, I would say warp it by hand. Oh, also, in terms of the algorithm, I think on here I was using, uh, on this one I was using beats, which for this bass line worked because I think partly because it was quite um, transient to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not always necessarily going to work. If it was a softer one, you'd probably want to use like Complex Pro, I think. So. Cool. All right, got time for one more question. Doug Payne is, wants to know, would using a guitar amp sim run through a bass cab impulse response to achieve a really hairy ba bass tone be effective? Hairy? Yeah. <laughs> I like the sound of a hairy bass tone. Um, Come on, Doug. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it absolutely could. I mean, um, I've done that quite a lot. I've recorded um, uh, guitars and bass DI, used, used amp simulators in Logic or, or Pro Tools or Live, and then turned off the speaker simulation and then sent it out to, a, to an amp. I mean, this is the thing. You can't just send it directly to a physical cabinet. You have to have an amp because yeah. the cabinet has to have, be, have a load. Uh, sorry, the amp has to have a load and the cabinet, you know, needs to be amplified. So I've done that before. If you get a nice neutral sound, you could totally use it. But similarly, I think uh, amp simulation and cabinet simulation is fantastic. The quality of it these days, honestly, you know, you should have heard what it was like 
15 years ago. <laughs> like, you know, it was a joke. Like, you know, nobody, if you turned up at a studio with, you know, one of the early devices for like guitar amp simulation, you said, oh yeah, I'm gonna do all my guitars through that. People would look at you like you're insane. Nowadays, no one thinks twice about it. In fact, I've made whole albums with really heavy rock bands where there's never been an amp in the studio, not once. So, wow. um, so what I, I do is I quite like, um, there's a, a plugin called Recabinet by Kazrog. Um, and sometimes if I really want to get a great speaker simulation, I use that. Um, so I use Amplitude or Guitar Rig to do the amp. And then rather than using the speaker simulation that I use, Recabinet, it's just got lots and lots of speaker models in, really sounds nice. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really good. I think the, there's a, I haven't tried the new version yet. There's version four's out and yeah. It, supposedly, it, why it sounds so good is because it's got built into it, it kind of emulates the way a speaker moves. So um, yeah, it's, you know, I, it really, really works well for me. Nice one. So unfortunately, we are out of time. Hopefully you got plenty of inspiration for the weekend. And if you're thirsty for more, you can learn from Anthony on our mixing courses, and you can find out more about those at pointblanklondon.com. And of course, Anthony's rack is available to download now, right in the description below this video. And while you're down there, make sure you hit subscribe. We'll see you next week for another FFL. Cheers. <laughs>